Let us begin. Um, so you see that we have your graded homework two here. You can pick this up after class. Um, for reasons I don't entirely understand, but the, the grader did explain that each homework's worth 14 points. <laughs> Seems like a rather arbitrary number, but she had a basis for it. Okay. So if you're wondering why it's worth 14 points, the answer is I don't know, don't ask me. Okay. But it doesn't matter, it just matters what percentage you got, right? Um, all right, so you have the MATLAB homework due next Wednesday. We have a couple of um, lectures before that. This will be the last lecture that the material is going to be on the test, okay? And they want to have a test next Thursday. And, ne and um, next Wednesday, I'll comment on the test, okay? But just so you know, which I've already said, it'll be open book, open note, all right? All right, and it'll be on statistics. Sh shocker, there. All right, so this is the last part of statistics we want to talk about. Um, this is very useful material. Maybe not yet for you guys, but when you, when you seniors, you'll take t two laboratory courses. You'll take Chemical Engineering 401, which is the required lab course. And then the second semester, you'll either take 402, which is like a continuation of 401, or you'll take the biochem. There's a biochem lab, so if you're on the biochem track, you'll take that. I forget the number um, of that particular class. But the, um, the idea is you'll do... Um, experiments, right, and then you do some analysis of data and things like this. And so what we've talked about extensively so far is um, data analysis, right? And of course, in a class like this, it's a little bit hard to talk about data. Like, how do you, you know, we don't do experiments in here, right? You don't see any equipment to do experiments. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is um, not actually doing experiments, but how to efficiently plan experiments. And this is something called experimental design. And this will be quite useful when you take um, the senior level courses. You guys, you don't really have any, you guys have an organic chemistry lab, right? That probably takes a lot of time and offers little in return, is my guess. <laughs> um, and is that the only lab course you have? Other than senior lab. Okay. A lot of universities have a junior lab and a senior lab, which would be maybe a good thing for us to think about. But anyway, so, you know, in, in um, what? 18 months, you'll find this stuff very useful, all right? All right, so what I'm going to do is go through an example, which I kind of already went through, but I'll go through in more detail because I use this to motivate the regression modeling we talked about yesterday. Um, so I'm going to use this as an example of why there's a need to do efficient experimental design. And then I'm going to talk about what, the, what is the basic idea behind experimental design and introduce some of the terminology for doing it. Um, then I'll talk about the general procedure, which, you know, involves planning, collecting data, analyzing data, things like this. And then I'm going to talk about three types of designs, okay? Now, if you look in your book, this topic is not in your book, okay? Um, and I should have given you, the, the, there is a very good website where I pulled a lot of this out. I don't think I put it in the notes, but I'll put it in there and then I'll repost it. But it's a NIST website. You know what NIST is? National Institute of Standards and... What's the rest? Technology? Is that what it stands for? All right. And they have a really nice website on all, all, all things involving experimental design. I pulled a lot of the information off of that. Okay. So the three designs we're going to talk about are um, full factorial designs. Okay. This is a pretty simple concept, but it's not very efficient. You can tell by the word factorial in there. Um, and then, so this is a basis th to understand experimental design. It's always, not always very practical to do. So then I'll introduce something called fractional factorial design, which is obviously doing a fraction of this, okay? Like half of them or a quarter of them. The idea is that these, if you do a fraction of these designs, you don't just pick randomly which ones. There's particular ways to pick which ones you do that make sense. And then at the end, I'll talk about, introduce the concept of central composite designs. And when I get to this point, I can explain the data set that you had yesterday. You remember that data set where I said everything scaled between minus two and two? <laughs> okay. I can explain where that data set came from once I, once I get to this point, okay? All right, so here's an example. Um, so this is, a, this is actually a system that used to exist. I assume it still does in polymer science that I worked on when I first got here a while back. Um, so this is for um, olefin polymerization. So olefins, you know, like propylene, ethylene, butylene, things like this. And so this is to make so-called um, copolymers, okay? 
So you have two monomers. This one commonly would be ethylene. This one commonly would be propylene. And you aspire to make polymer out of these two monomers. Okay? And so you're going to do this in a reactor that looks like this. Okay, this, this react, of course, you supply the um, ethylene and propylene as gases because they're gases at room temperature. So you run this reactor under pressure because you want the gases to dissolve in the liquid and then react. So when you guys take 110, right, I assume when you take 110, they throw up some gratuitous pictures of like big distillation columns and stuff, right, and reactors. Okay, so you've seen a chemical reactor before. You may not know the details. All right. So you have these gases. These things here just clean up the gas so it doesn't have particulate matter in it. These things here just means you're controlling the flow and you'll learn all about this when you take the control class. But obviously if you want to make a reproducible polymer, you have to control the amount of each of these gases coming in and that's what these little valves do here. And this PLC control system, don't worry about it. Gases come in here, you operate this under pressure so the gases dissolve into the liquid, okay, and the reaction takes place there. Now, um, in order for this reaction to take place, it has to be catalyzed. So ethylene and if you put ethylene and propylene together in a solvent, so this is a solution polymerization, this might be like hexane, hexane or toluene or some nasty solvent like this where this reaction takes place. If you just mix up propylene and um, ethylene in a mixture of toluene, they won't do anything <laughs> except dissolve, okay? So get them react, you have to catalyze them. So you have to put in catalysts. The catalyst is not actually shown in this particular picture, but you have to uh, put a catalyst in here. And actually, for the type of catalysis that, th that olefin polymerization, actually there's two types that could take place, which I won't get into the details. Maybe you'll learn this in kinetics, or if you take the polymer introduction to polymer uh, engineering, you might learn this. But the idea is there's two catalyst species, these species get together to form what's called an active site. An active site means that's where the, the chains can actually grow from. So although not shown here, there's also the addition of two types of uh, catalysts in here. Okay? So they're in the liquid here. And then because this, when you grow this polymer chain, bonds are broken. There's a lot of heat generated. So you need to remove heat from the system. And that's what this thing does here. Okay. So the idea here is there's five things that you could play around with. How much ethylene, let's say, how much propylene, temperature, how much of each of the two catalysts. Okay, so that's five different things. And that's the five things I listed here. I call them input variables at this point. Okay, catalyst, co-catalyst concentrations, the concentrations or flow, whatever you want to call it, of the two monomers, ethylene and propylene, perhaps the temperature of the reactor. Okay. So these are the things that you can adjust, okay? Here's what you would probably like to achieve by operating this system, okay? Let's say you're operating this system at scale, not a laboratory, okay? Like this was a big reactor in industry. You'd want to make as much polymer as you could, right? Because um, if you're in a good economy, then every pound of polymer you can make, you can sell. If the economy is bad, then it's not the way it works. But let's just say you can sell all you make. So you want to maximize it. And then you also have to achieve some properties of the polymer. The, this polymer is a very complex chain, right? And if you think about it, it, you know, it could have like, an, it's a chain of let's say a thousand units. So it could be like ethylene, 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 propylene, ethylene. You see, I mean, it's, it could be a very complex chain. <coughs> Depending on how the ethylene and propylene add to this chain changes the properties of the polymer. Determines like whether you can use it to make bottles or make hard plastics for a phone or whatever you might want to use this material for, okay? tires, whatever you're interested in using this copolymer for. Um, so there's certain properties that you want to achieve. And, and the reason I bring up a lot of polymer examples in the class, even though I know you guys aren't expert in this, is I have a lot of, I worked a lot with ExxonMobil on polymer, so I know, actually know a lot about this. And I think as you progress through the curriculum, it's always nice to have some of these ideas tied to something that's actually real. So my ability to tie something real is limited by my own idea of real, <laughs> okay? But I know this, I know this particular area, so that's why I choose that. All right, so if you're making a polymer um, either in a manufacturing environment or you're just trying to develop a new polymer for a customer, the customer will tell you the properties they want, okay? You have to meet these specifications on the properties for them to want the polymer. If you, if you make a polymer that doesn't meet these specifications, they won't buy it from you, okay? 
And we talked a little bit about when we did data analysis, how you determine whether you've met the properties by doing you know, like hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, and these kind of things, okay? So now we're talking about how you're going to generate the data to do the analysis in the first place. So these are typically the things that you would call outputs. In other words, you can vary these five things, and these are the probably four things you're interested in, okay? How much polymer you make, okay? Pounds per hour, pounds per day, or something like that. Copolymer composition. So even though the chains are very complex, we'll limit our analysis to how much ethylene is in the chain, how much propylene. Like, you know, it's 60% ethylene, 40% propylene. We don't care how it adds, like if it's all propylene here or, and all ethylene here, or it's random, we just call it all the same. So we're interested in how much of each of the um, types of monomer are in there by, a, by amount, percentage, let's say. All right, and then there'll be two um, measures of the molecular weight. Since we're going to talk about this example more than once, I'll just draw this picture. So if um, you were to draw... Um, Yeah. Sorry. Let's say that you pulled out, um, like, right, you got a pair of tweezers and you pulled out a thousand chains of polymer and you measured how long they were or how much they weighed or something like this. You would find some of the chains are shorter, some are longer. They're not all the same length, okay? And they actually follow a distribution. Distribution might look, I don't know, maybe it looks kind of normal. It looks something like this. So this is the molecular weight, and this is some measure of the frequency that you get that molecular weight. I won't even bother labeling that axis, okay? So you might imagine that if you have polymer that looks like this, someone might be interested in something associated with like what is the average molecular weight of the polymer and how variable is the polymer, right? This makes sense to you? Like there's a distribution of molecular weights. The person that buys it wants you to give them the right molecular weight on average. And then they, want they probably have a variability specification. Like, don't make this distribution too broad. Okay? And that's kind of what I mean by two measures of molecular weight. Maybe the average and the variance or something along these lines. They have different names for them, but just go with that for now. All right. All right, so let's say you're in a pilot plant or laboratory setting, and you had a new customer come to you, and your job, because you work in the pilot plant. You ever knows what a pilot plant is, right? So a pilot plant is a small plant that you use for development. It's more than a lab scale. Lab scales are usually chemists. Therefore, we don't really like that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a pilot plant is something people build the intermediate scale between the lab and the production plant. Okay? You build a pilot plant for two reasons. One reason you build it is because you dare not build a plant without building a pilot plant first to see if it's going to scale. You know, so you've got a scaling issue, right? You do something in the lab, you make like 100 grams, and now you need to make 10,000 pounds a day. It's a big jump in scale. The intermediate stage is a pilot plant. And my favorite story about pilot plants is, so at one point people said, we've advanced so far, we don't need pilot plants. So um, I think it was DuPont. In fact, I know it was DuPont. They built a $200 million plant, and they could never run it. They're like, how about pilot plants, you know? So they went back to the pilot plant approach. Um, the other reason you have a pilot plan is because then you can do development work, right? You can develop products on the pilot. You can't take a manufacturing plant and do, make new products you've never made. Because the plant's just got to be pumping out polymer 24 hours a day to make money, okay? So in the, in the pilot plant, you can do testing, new development of new products. So you, let's say you work in this pilot plant and someone comes in with some specifications, right? They, th so it won't be really a production specification maybe at that point, but they'll, they'll have... Uh, specifications on how much ethylene and propylene they want in the polymer, and they also have specifications on that molecular weight distribution thing I showed there, okay? And so th your task is to find out how to make this polymer, and these are things you can adjust, right? So here's what I'm trying to try to convince you is not a good idea. I call it brute force approach. It's just kind of random. So you, you, you set values for all five of these things, do an experiment, take, get some polymer, take it to the laboratory, measure these things, and if you don't like them, then you say, I bet I need more catalyst. <laughs> Add some more catalyst. Do it all again. It's all random. It's all just trial and error in many ways, okay? That's um, not very efficient. It's very time consuming. You know, each of these uh, experiments might take a, day, a couple of days. So, you know, you can, you can make, you can do two or three runs a week. So you got to have some some reasonable way to try to focus the experiments in, in the domain where you think it's going to give good information or useful information, okay? 
So this kind of brute force or random approach, if the problem is really simple, you know, like, not like this one, this might be okay, but when the problem, you get all these handles you can adjust, this is not efficient at all, okay? So what I'm going to teach you is something, the statistical design of experiments. So when I say allows more efficient search of the input space, the input space is five-dimensional space, right? It, these are the dimensions, catalyst, co-catalyst, monomer one, monomer two, temperature. You're trying to find a place in that five-dimensional space that, gives, that meets these specifications. It's non-trivial. Okay, it's non-trivial for one because the system's not linear, you know. And you might double the amount of catalyst and you might increase, you know, like the production by a factor of 10 or something like this. Um, yeah, so that's this. So these, these techniques um, allow more efficient space, uh, search of this input space that you're trying to find or search over. They can account for the fact that variables interact. So in other words, if I increase the catalyst by a factor of two and the temperature by a factor of two, I can guarantee you the polymer rate will go up more than by a factor of two. Okay, because system's not linear. Okay. So this is what we're going to focus in. How do we go about doing an efficient search of this space to, let's say, for example, find the best values of the inputs that will meet these specifications? Okay, that's called experimental design or design of experiments. So a problem looks something like this. I, I, I don't know where I stole this picture from, uh, but I bet I stole it from that NIST website, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, so they've got a little bit different terminology in experimental design than I tend to use, but we'll go over it. Okay, so these are the kind of things that we need to be concerned with. We'll go into much more detail about these things, but so when I say design objective, I, I'm asking, this is a question you have to ask before you go into doing the experiments and the design, is what do you hope to learn, okay? Like, if you said, I hope to learn if what happens if I change temperature, will that increase or decrease production? That's an easy question to answer. You don't need a lot of experiments to figure that one out. But if you ask the question, what do, should the values of all five of these things be to meet these specifications, that's a much more difficult problem to answer, okay? You gotta decide up front what you hope to gain by doing the experiments. Um, and then, so there's a variety of terms used. I, I like to call these things inputs. These are the handles you have you can change in order to get data, okay? The experiments d differ from each other because you have different values of the inputs. In the experimental design world, these things are called factors, just the way it is. You just have to get used to it. It means the same thing. These are the independent variables. You move these around to explore the operating space of the process you're interested in, and typically these things will have some constraints on them. Okay? So for example, if you're operating a reactor, um, there'll be constraints on the lower and upper temperature you're going to be al allowed to run the reactor. Right? Because, you know, you'll start, there would be safety concerns, might be material design concerns, okay? So usually these, are, these have lower and upper bounds specified that you can actually um, move between, okay? So those I'll often call inputs, but sometimes call factors, they mean the same thing. Outputs um, are things that you, are the d dependent variables. In other words, you change these and then observe how these things changes. In the design world, they call these things responses for whatever reason, okay? These things have to be chosen to reflect what you hope to learn from the experiment. So if you want to know, if you're trying to get some molecular weight distribution that's acceptable, then you better have outputs that reflect the molecular weight distribution, right? I mean, this is a no-brainer, okay? And these things have to be measured. And so when you go into, um, you know, about half of you will probably go in, ultimately go into the chemical industry, is my guess. Um, you'll find that some things are really easy to measure, or you could go into any industry. Some things are really easy to measure. Temperature, pressure, flow, composition maybe. Some things are hard to measure, like, you know, microstructure of a carbon nanotube <laughs> or molecular weight distribution. So it's implicit when we say that we have these things that we have some ability to measure them. We don't talk in this class about how you measure the molecular weight, but I am assuming you can do it. And you can, all right? So the whole idea behind statistical design of experiments is you want to get as much information out of as few experiments as you can, okay? Because if you're, if you're working on this pilot plant, um, I can tell you how things work. You have a backlog of things that people have asked you to do, right? Because you might have like four plants around the world and they're occasionally asking you to do things like we had a problem with this product, could you do these tests? We had a new product, can you do this? 
And so you don't have a lot of time to get the answer for any one problem. You have to do it fast. And so you're trying to get as much information as you can um, with as little effort as you can. Obviously, you'll appreciate as we go into this that if you can't get anything for free, right? So if you do almost no experiments, you'll get almost no information. But the idea here is let's get as much information as we can from as few experiments as possible, okay? And in principle, what we do is we design the whole experimental plan in advance and just execute it, okay? So for example, um, I might decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, which is in the spreadsheet I gave you, I'm going to do 27 experiments. What, are, what does 27 experiments mean? Each experiment is going to have a different value of these five things, and I plan in advance all 27 of them. And I'm just going to execute them one by one. It's going to take me 54 days maybe, okay? Somewhere along the line, I might change my plan because, you know, I realize I'm not getting out of the experiments what I hope for, but in principle, they're all, they're all planned in advance, okay? So this list picture here um, describes is pretty much what I talked about. So here's all the things you can change. These are the inputs or factors. These are all the things that change as a result. These are called outputs or responses. Don't worry about this stuff up here. But there's going to be mitigating circumstances that are going to screw you up. So these are things that change, but you have no control over, okay? Like I can tell you, if, if you have the misfortune of getting a job in like the middle of Texas, <laughs> if you go out into the, into the field, which I don't recommend, but if you, let's say you go out, you know what the field is? It means out, it doesn't mean the football field, okay? It means the, the, the plant. You go into the plant, all the reactors piping, um, it's going to be like incredibly hot, right? And the actual equipment will run differently during the day than at night. Because during the day, the equipment is the sunshine, the, the, you know, you have a column, it's made of stainless steel, it might be uh, like 175 degrees. And then at night, it's running at, you know, 75 degrees. So these are, this is something you have no control over. So in other words, if you do an experiment at night, you're going to have a different answer than if you run it during the day. Okay. Same thing with things like relative humidity and so on and so forth. Some of these things that happen, um, you can at least account for in the sense you can measure them, right? Like you can measure the temperature if you want. You can measure the humidity. Sometimes things happen that you have no control over and you don't even know happened. Like you're doing a test and some operator, someone from the operations staff goes out in the plant and starts fooling around with the equipment, right? <laughs> Not much you can do about that. So I'll talk a little bit about what you do for that. So these are the inputs you can control, and these are the inputs you have no control over, okay? All right, so these are the kind of things that we might want to do when we do this kind of experimental design. So this is going from least amount of information we hope to gain to the most amount of information that we can gain, okay? A comparative design might be something like to turn the best, determine the best alternative out of different options, okay? So in this case, you're just screening some alternatives. You know, an example of this kind of thing might be, like, I want to know what the effective temperature is, right? Like, if you want to know what the effective temperature is, um, or let's say a couple of inputs, then there'll be a minimal number of experiments you can do to get that information. A full factorial design that I'm going to talk about is like the maximal number of experiments that you'd probably consider. We want to do smaller numbers. Okay. Screening experiments, that says you want to determine what are the most important factors, okay? So in other words, let's say you're making this polymer and you're, you're saying, oh, what is the most important thing that affects the amount of ethylene in the polymer? Is it the ethylene flow, the propylene flow, catalyst, co-catalyst, or temperature, right? You want to determine which of those is most important. Why would you care about that? Because let's say you're operating the plant and the eth you, go, you make polymer, you take it to the lab, you measure it, it doesn't have enough ethylene. Right? Doesn't have enough ethylene. So you need to do something. So the smart thing to do is find out what has the strongest effect on ethylene and change it in the hope of getting the product back on target. And so this would be really useful information for operating the reactor, right? You'll learn what are the best handles to affect each of the outputs. Okay? And so this type of screening experiment is very, very useful for um, um, kind of adjustment of the products, let's say. All right, what I talked, this is kind of much more, so in other words, you need very little information here. You need s some, in quotes, information here. Here you need a lot of information, like a lot of experiments. This is what we talked about last time, response surface modeling. You need to play around with that tool in MATLAB. So the, the kind of questions you might be asking here is, if I, wanna, if I want the output to have a specified value, what combination of inputs will give it to me? 
Okay, these are things that need a model is my point, you, you right? So if you have a regression model like I, like I told you, you could, pl remember how we play, you could specify the inputs and told you what it thinks the outputs will be? So once you have a model like that, you could play around with the combination of inputs, see which one will give you the specifications that you'd actually like. Maybe you want to minimize or maximize some output that has a minimum or a maximum. You could use a model for that. Reducing the variability, achieving um, robustness to operating conditions. You know what this means? This means, let's say you're making a polymer and your goal is to make the specifications um, that the customer wants. Robustness means if something changes in the plant, if the system's robust, it won't have a big effect on the properties of the polymer. A plant like that would be robust, okay? If a plant's not robust, you can imagine that something happens to this reactor system here that causes, you know, let's say you don't quite achieve the desired temperature or something. If to make the right polymer requires the temperature be 99, you know, 299.65 degrees, and if you move from that, it won't work. This plant can never be operated, you understand? That's not robust. So once you have a model like that, you can see, ah, if the temperature changes, how much is that gonna change the properties of the polymer? Is it robust to changes in temperature or not? Okay. Um, all right, satisfy com multiple and competing objectives, okay. So right, some of these objectives I talked about on the previous slide um, could be, they're competing with each other. So in other words, if you wanna achieve high production rate, that might compete with your ability to make a particular distribution that you'd like, right? So these things might, you have to satisfy objectives, multiple ones that are not easily satisfied at the same time. And we already talked about this last time, which I'll talk a little more about, basically developing a model to predict how things work. Okay. All right, so now to the input level. So those are the things we're gonna change in order to get data, okay? So the first thing you have to do, obviously, which is not specified here, but I'll talk about it, you have to pick out what, what are the inputs that you can adjust. So in the polymer example, I won't say them because we know what they are. There's five inputs we can adjust, okay? Once you make that decision, you have to decide what are the low and high limits that you're gonna allow those things to be adjusted. I mean, for example, here it doesn't make any sense. Let's say you wanna adjust the catalyst. A low limit of zero doesn't make any sense because if you have a low limit of zero, you'll put no catalyst, you'll get no polymer at all, <laughs> okay? So based on operational knowledge, you might have some idea of what is a reasonable range of temperature, catalyst, ethylene, propylene, and that's gonna limit this five-dimensional space to a five-dimensional hypercube kind of thing. Okay, you can only move in there, okay? And um, I, these need to be chosen so that um, things are feasible. So in other words, this, once you just define the limits of all these inputs, then the, the properties that you want had better be achievable with the inputs in that range. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if you want to make a lot of polymer, then that may require you operate at a high temperature, but if you don't allow a high temperature, then achieving a lot of polymer won't be feasible. So you have to pick them, yeah, some sensible way. All right, so with, with these input levels, there's two ways you can do this. And this is very, the common way it does it. You can pick two values of the inputs, like high and low, or you can pick three values. Low, medium, high, basically, okay? So the reason the number of in input levels are important because they have a big effect on the number of experiences that you're about to see. So if you have a two-level design, it means each input is low and high. Low and high is determined by these limits, right? Low means you're at the lower limit for that input, high means you're at the higher limit. These are very efficient because they lead to a small number of designs and economical kind of means the same thing, right? You don't have to do a lot of experiments. Um, and so these are very good for that screening type of thing I talked about, right? Sorry to go back, but this kind of thing. What's the most important factor? You can figure that out by just going high and low, okay? All right. Um, if you want to do something like build a response surface model, you remember when we did the response surface model, um, there was a linear model, right? But you could also do these things that had interactions and quadratic terms. That means the model has curvature. And you can't figure out curvature with two experiments. That, I hope that makes sense to you, right? Like three, if you want to know if something has nonlinearity or curvature, you got to do at least three experiments to know that. Okay, so that's what these are good for. They have three levels, you know, low, medium, and high. So nominal would be the normal value. You probably have that input out. This is the lower limit. That's the upper limit. Okay. 
A lot less efficient than two level designs as you're about to see, but give you a lot more information, including the kind of information you need to do response surface modeling. Okay? All right. So we already talked about this, but I'm just going to go over it again. So this is a response surface model. So that you might think of experimental design like this. I have some output that I'd like to know its effect. I have three inputs. You know, for example, that might be catalyst, ethylene, temperature. Okay? And I want to know how those three things affect um, ethylene content in the polymer, whatever. Okay? And so I would like to build a model of that relationship. This model is not fundamental, right? It's an empirical model. It's ba based on data. It doesn't satisfy mass balances or energy <laughs> balances or thermodynamics or anything like that. It's all data driven. Okay? So we did this last time. You'd want maybe a linear model that looks like this, right? So here's the output of interest. There are the three inputs of interest. And you'll build a linear model like that. That's like a bias term. And then you have a linear term involving each of the inputs. In the, the experimental design world, they call these things the main effects. These linear terms are called the main effects. Okay? If you have four parameters, here's a, here's a simple quiz. If you have four parameters that you don't know, right? Because you don't know these betas. You need to find them. How many experiments do you think you need? Don't look here. Okay. Okay, it was a pretty easy quiz. Um, you got to have at least four experiments to find four parameters, right? And you, probably you want a lot more. It's, it's kind of when you do, like when you do linear regression, of course you can fit a line to two data points. You, it wouldn't be smart to do so because if either the data points have any error, you'll get a terrible slope or intercept. But you need at least four experiments to do this. Okay, you might have a model with interactions. So this is a model that says you have the, the bias term, you have the main effect terms or the linear terms, then you have these kind of quadratic terms. Okay. These quadratic terms are here because you think the response of this output to these inputs is not linear. And you think, for example, that if you change x1 and x2 at the same time, their effect isn't additive. Okay. In other words, they have like a synergistic effect. When you change x1 and x2 at the same time, their effect is bigger than the things changed separately. And that's what that term counts for. Okay. So it's, a, it's an admission that the underlying relationship is not linear. Okay. And so obviously this thing can grow. If you have a lot of these x's, you'll have a lot of these interaction terms. And I think for the example that we played around with yesterday, if you did the linear model, there were six coefficients. And if you did the interaction model, there were 16. Because there's lots of combinations of five inputs like this. Okay. So these are called binary interaction terms. Obviously, seven parameters. You'll need at least seven experiments. Okay. And you might go one step further, and people never, I don't think, go further than this. You have the bias, linear, interaction, and then quadratic. Okay. The, so these are meant to account for nonlinear effects of, let's say, x1 that are independent of any of the other inputs. Right. These are nonlinearities that are x1 times x2. These are nonlinearities, just x1 by itself. Okay. <coughs> And these will account for the kind of curvature in the response that you might see. Okay. Ten parameters need at least ten experiments. So what this little table does is said, depending on the number of factors or inputs you have, depending on the type of model you have, this is the number of parameters you'll have in this model. Okay. So for example, if you had five, like for a polymer reactor, you had five inputs and you wanted an interaction model, you have 16 parameters. That means you've got to do at least 16 experiments, probably a lot more. Okay. So in other words, if you know you want a model like this, then you know 16 is the bare minimum. So in other words, if you're not willing to do 16 experiments, abandon the idea of getting this type of model. It's not possible. 